co-creation, open innovation and design thinking are approaches to involve different kind of people into innovation processes. So it might be consumers, might be users, citizens. To your experience, what approaches work best? In my mind, it depends very much what you want to achieve. And um, in my book, uh, Five Superpowers for Co-Creators, what I focused on is trying to offer uh, a set of building blocks so that uh, uh, initiators of change can kind of figure out what the end goal, goal is that they want and, and design to specifically to the goal of, the, of what they want to achieve. So, for example, I would make a great difference between um, a participatory um, uh, and a participatory approach and uh, an open innovation. I, I think they can be mutually exclusive. Uh, if participatory uh, is understood as consensus building, I think that is, uh, you know, a killer to innovation um, in certain ways. So I think it's important uh, to differentiate between uh, three different uh, aspects of, um, of any innovation process or co-creation process. And that is on one hand to be clear in terms of the roles. Um, and I would suggest to differentiate between the person who is the initiator, who carries the idea, and the person who is the facilitator, very specifically, often these are roles that are combined in one and the same person, so that can create quite some obstacles in the process. The second one is to have uh, clarity in terms of what is the process that we want to go through, when do different groups need to be together to, to, to co-create together, when is, the, it is, is it time to, to uh, reach out to others and, and um, build in others so that they, they will join the process in the next phase. So what needs to happen when and what are the right activities for what phase? And then thirdly, I would also look at the kind of a progress clarity. Where are we in terms of where we want to be so that we can achieve the goal that we have set? So uh, role clarity, process clarity and progress clarity would be uh, kind of my, my different views of uh, or perspectives of then trying to determine what are the right uh, and best uh, um, processes. So I can't really give you a one answer for saying, here is the one process that works. Personally, personally in my experience, I work a, I, I use a mix of a whole bunch of different processes and use this as kind of a toolbox to figure out when to use what. What are the differences between uh, innovation processes which are initiated by companies? So with a clear purpose of developing new technologies or products or solutions, or services and in co-creation processes which are rather initiated by societal actors. It's in a traditional process that kind of comes out of design thinking, you know, you take the idea or process that are simply here to come up with the next product or services uh, evolution or revolution in the company. Um, I would say they have the very clear um, um, objective of, of generating a new product or service that has some market appeal to some kind of target identified target audience group that, and that process will be different than if if you're trying to gather multi-stakeholders to solve a societal problem now what we're trying to do since we recognize that uh, companies are such important innovators and contributors to solving societal problems is to ensure upfront what they have to gain to participate in processes that help solve societal problems and to even make it a strategic process for them whereby they they can be initiators to say let's solve um, a water purity or a gender inequality issue in in our area because they understand that this can be actually a a key innovation for them to come up with products and services that that are far beyond what they have currently offered. What kind of approaches to participatory innovation fit best to this idea of changing society, sustainable development, responsible innovation? What kind of methods fit best? I would in invite you to look at, at, at answering the question differently by actually focusing first on what is the outcome that you want and not how can I amend an existing process to embed a different purpose into it? So, for example, if you want to create, if you want to go about solving a societal issue, you know per se that this is going to require most likely a multi-stakeholder um, approach. One single player cannot solve it. So, what are the building blocks that are needed to, to innovate or co-create 
that new solution. And I think then according for what building blocks you identify that are needed and what stakeholders are in there, you will choose different methods that help you. As we know well in innovation, there is a phase where brainstorming is, is really important so that nobody cuts down the just the flow of new ideas. But then there is also a selection process needed where you very much want to have the, 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 the critical assessment of how valid an idea is. So depending on what happens in the process, you have different existing tools that, that serve very well the different processes. Who's the one in these processes who designs about the process? So you said, if you select these methods, if you know about the purpose, who is in the driving seat of such processes? In, in my experience of, of a variety of, um, of such co-creation processes, this was actually probably one of, the, one of the biggest issues we could identify in, hi in hindsight that have caused difficulties. That's why I had in, in, uh, mentioned initially that role clarity is so critical. And often the... I call it the, the, the initiator, the person who has, who is kind of the inviter, the, the driver for this project. He or she also thinks that they have to, to define the process. Um, and that is really challenging. Uh, in a specific meeting, for example, and I've been, I've been, I've made that mistake myself. I've been the, in, uh, the, the initiator and the facilitator. It's a, it's a role I like, and I've really mixed. And I've seen how it how it how it can harm the process um, in several ways. Um, for for example, for uh, if I'm an uh, an, initi an initiator and a facilitator in a meeting that I facilitate, I should not take the role of also contributing content, even though I have a great stake at actually contributing content. But that is that questions then my ability to to be seen as a as a as, as a facilitator of the process. So if you have role clarity, I will clearly say that the process belongs to the facilitator, the content belongs to the participants. You talked about being clear about the roles. What about being clear about the boundaries and the objectives of such an open innovation process? Yeah, this is, a, this is an excellent question. Um, if I take the example of the packaging uh, project that I'm working on for the moment, kind of uh, looking at uh, the challenge that uh, different types of packaging, plastic, uh, plastic packaging are currently not um, integrated into the recycling schemes of Switzerland. Uh, we initially started with um, multi-product packaging, um, such as... Um, um, milk, milk wraps. I was gonna, I was gonna say Tetra Pak, but I, it's not about using a brand. It's about using these, uh, these, uh, these multiple products, product, product um, packaging. Initially, a very important. I, I was talking about building blocks before. A very important part of such building blocks is that the initial building block is all about clarifying that purpose. And we went through a number of rounds whereby. Uh, with increasing, um, we, then actually we had two rounds in that example with different stakeholders, whereby we broadened the topic of saying it is not just about integrating multiple product packaging into the existing recycling structure. It is actually about finding out how can we innovate the recycling structure in such a way that the innovation of new packaging products that, that are now under European regulation requiring, for example, an end of single-use plastic can be into, can, can embrace such new requir legal requirements that are coming up. So it is obviously a question of framing, of framing the whole challenge, of framing the whole co-creation process. Do you on purpose support a reframing of certain questions. So if the question is a new technology, but the frame might be a whole new system, how do you lead to the point where the people in the companies involved accept the reframing? You involve them in the reframing, as, as easy as that. But we, what we did, just to go back to this uh, packet, packaging example, we started with one kind of a charter or one page that we had uh, sent to the companies that that we wanted to be a part of this uh, of this uh, uh, innovation process, and during the innovation process, we spent 
our goal was to jointly question whether we were asking the right question. And then for me as a facilitator, the task was to come up with a three or four hour process that allowed questioning the framing and come up with with agreement on a on a different framing. And you 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 there that and that that is a great example of showing you that you cannot use an existing process. You then need to go into your toolbox as a facilitator and say which elements of what what existing processes serve me to in the end having an agreement on a reframing that hopefully is both appropriate given the, the challenges that are there and interesting and acceptable for those that are that are that are there. Whenever we have new people joining us, we do spend a bit of time in the beginning where we share what the vision is and we do on purpose allow to bring new people on board for them to question that that uh, to to question that uh, overall vision and to see whether we need to amend it and enrich it. And this can only happen uh, with everybody present. And you want to be careful that as you go on, uh, a new player cannot totally change the purpose of that without agreement of everybody else. Um, some t but my, my experience, sometimes like these naive questions of new participants are the most profound insights that then bring the shift towards an understanding of, we better stop and take a step back before we go forward. How many people do you involve in such co-creation processes? It, it really depends. Uh, I think it, it, uh, it, it's, it, you could, I've, I've, I've managed such processes for as little as 10 people and for as many as 100 people. Um, for the moment, uh, for example, just to give you an example, for the moment, we, what we've done is we've outsourced an innovation step in the in this recycling process, where, whereby we went to uh, a leading Swiss university and, and tasked their students to come up with a hackathon to really give us the young perspective of the, of the packaging situation in 20 years from now. And, and all of us stayed back and none of us were involved in the process. We just simply want to see what a bunch of... Uh, of graduate students at the university come up when they throw their own co-creation process and they will feed us back what their innovation is. So that's also a building block in our innovation because we said we're just too old and too much in the system to come up with radical new ideas, but we need radical new ideas. So we simply gave that step to other stakeholders that and they are tasked to run that themselves. Very often what we notice is that as we move forward through the process, we only start to understand who the actual stakeholders are that we want to have or that we need to have involved to actually find the ultimate solution in the process. So we are changing the group of those involved as we go on. In a way, this is good because it, it removes a bit of the pressure to be perfect in the beginning and to invite everybody there. You just start with a group that you think are re relevant critical thinkers that maybe maybe in the beginning is it's smart not to be too many. And then to kind of find out what is the path and the process that you need to have in order to get to the solution, including broadening or reducing the, the focus. Sounds as if this is like dancing with systems, as the famous quote of Donella Meadows is. So how do you analyze the system that you dance with? How do you know whom to involve? I find action research a really useful uh, uh, a, approach to look at it, Acno therefore acknowledging that me as the observer am part of the system and not pretending that I'm a neutral observer because my observation actually influences the system. And action research is, is very specifically clear in making sure that as I am observing, I'm clear about the ingoing assumptions I'm making over the, uh, for the system and over the assumptions and how and that I observe how my 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 ingoing perceptions are changing over time as I am becoming more and more involved and knowledgeable about the system. So uh, I find that really useful. I find the, the pure or traditional academic uh, sense or scientific approach of saying I'm a neutral observer and I shall now tell you what the system looks like less useful. 
Do you use any kind of specific methods to make the participants aware of the fact that they are part of a system? So, for example, social network analysis, system dynamics, or participatory system mapping. There are different visualization techniques that could be applied to make the participants aware of the position, the role, and the dynamics of the whole system they are part of. What I have found is that initially what I needed to do with participants is to gain their trust as a facilitator, kind of to, to ensure that they trusted that I was capable of leading them from A to Z. And for that, they wanted to understand a bit of the, the thinking and the theory behind the process. Um, what happens as you do that, you of course, you remove them from the content and you make them observers of what they are in. Typically, this is not super useful in an innovation process because you take them into an analytical men mental headspace. I would personally, I would be very careful of, go, of showing them where they are in the system. This will probably make the difference. That this will this will enlarge the differences um, rather than overcome rather than overcome them. What I, what I do spend some time on is uh, helping them understand so they get comfort in what are the process steps where we are and what the challenges are. And I, I differentiate between challenges of um, at the individual level, like what are my personal challenges as I am a participant in here? What are kind of group challenges? What are the tensions between organizations or, or players? What is happening there? And what are also challenges at the facilitator level? And as a facilitator, I sometimes use the facilitation challenges as a way when I see that there are conflicts at the individual or group level, I use some of the, cha the, the participation, uh, the facilitation challenges to outline that we are stuck. How do you, in your co-creation processes, build up trust? Which elements do you use to build up trust in, in what do people trust in these processes? Trust is a very interesting thing to understand, <laughs> to, an to analyze. Um, and I think it happens um, at a deeper at a deeper level than just the mental level. So yes, I do provide them um, with the I give them mental comfort by showing them that there is a journey and that that I'm in control of that journey and that that they can rely on me. And that comes with you know my creden my my credentials as what I have already done and by showing them what the process is and, and so forth. What I find um, and this is probably classroom experience that that you may share. What I believe is a, a really fast way of, uh, of building trust at a deeper level is to be authentic in moments or in moments when I have been inauthentic, i.e. admitting when I when I faked it, kind of like, you know, there's there's tons of moments where uh, as a facilitator, I'm I'm put in a situation where I come up with a quick answer to solve something that that actually was not entirely correct. When I stop the process and go right back and say like, oh, five minutes ago when you asked me this questions about this, I told you that, but actually I have to be, I have to be honest, I have no clue, or that was the wrong answer. Now thinking about it, this would be true. Admitting an inauthentic moment in an, you know, generates uh, generates authenticity and therefore trust. To me, these are always the quickest the quickest way. A bit of kind of um, self depreciated uh, humor about my I me too I I I am flawed is very useful. Do you work in teams of facilitators mm -hmm. or is it just you? I love working in teams. Um, I love working in pairs. Um, for example, I find it useful to have different energies present. It uh, doesn't need to be male, female. It can be active uh, and more still. It can be many different uh, polarities that are there. Um, I love working with facilitators that on one hand are very strict and stuck to the process. We have an agenda. We're going to get through it. And somebody who is more kind of paying attention to the energy in the room and will say, screw the process. Now we need to do that. I find that really productive. Um, but very often um, I'm forced to play, to hold these two roles uh, myself because the budget isn't there to have two facilitators there. Could you imagine of any kind of facilitator contract where you would say, no, I don't do that under these conditions? No. 
you know, these these are messy processes. I think we need to be very clear about that. Uh, I haven't personally come across a, a, a moment where I would say, more I'm stepping out of this. Um, there may very well be. I haven't, encounter, I haven't encountered it yet. Um, we had an example with a collaboratory in South Africa that um, nearly broke down. And I think the issue there, if I remember correctly, was um, this was uh, probably more. It was it was it was kind of set up as a collaboratory around um, a very critical issue at the time. Around that, there were um, in the in the South African wineries the the. The employers were uh, the the wine pickers went on strike um, and the wineries uh, couldn't collect their wine, so they set up a collaboratory to kind of uh, sort out what were the underlying issues. There, there were a number of underlying uh, social issues that were hidden underneath the 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 reason why the the wine pickers were on strike, and that what well, part of that was that uh, part of the compensation was free access to alcohol. And that free access to alcohol led to family dysfunctioning of the of the families that were part of the wine pickers and school. Therefore, children not going to school and, and divorce rates and so forth. So, um, this was a multifaceted process um, that we went through, or that uh, that my colleagues went through. I wasn't part of that. That eventually led to new design principles of how to actually engage together and how to compensate or not compensate and how to build in the families and uh, some beautiful solutions came up. For example, uh, Friday evenings became a, a moment where all of the wives of all of the wine pickers would be invited at the wineries to produce a common meal that everybody was contributing to which was one way of making sure that the, that the men wouldn't drink too much. The women felt them included because they could they could cook the meal together with the, with the farm owners and so forth. So some wonderful outcomes came there. Um, the process, however, broke nearly broke down when, when two, uh, and I think there was political parties were involved there as well. This was around the election period. And I think a political party and the winery were trying to claim um, ownership of having accomplished this negotiation and came up with a, uh, an unverified press release about the results behind everybody's back. And that, I mean, that became a no-go for the facilitator of saying, but at the same time, he couldn't step back from the process, otherwise the process would have probably gone back into the next strike level. Um, so even though this was a violation of some really deep values that totally destroyed the trust of the process, the facilitator needed to stay on there and hold things together. So I'm saying all of that to say, as a facilitator, I'm not sure you, you can have moments where you step out. You're probably the last resort in moments of crises that will emerge to hold things together. Uh, you talked about these collaboratories. How many processes being called collaboratory or working under the principles of collaboratory, have there been around the world? It's a good question. I don't know. We we don't claim any, you know, we don't claim claim any uh, royalties on the process. So anybody is free to use them. We, we wrote uh, or I edited a book about uh, the use of collaboratories uh, back. I think it was in 2013, and uh, I was collecting different uh, examples of how it's used in the classroom, in society, in business. And I was surprised to see that, you know, Unilever used it in India. There was the use of it in Africa. Somebody used it in Australia, in the U.S. I had no idea about that. This came when we collected the book and we looked for, for chapters, we found out. Uh, I have today, I have, I have little idea of how widespread it is used. Um, what I what I based my research on when I wrote the Five Superpowers book is um, some EU funding that we had through the through the EU to set up um, collaboratories uh, uh, in 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 Europe through you know through a three or five three initially three year period and then enlarged to another uh, to a total of five year period. I think we had probably first probably you know a good dozen of, uh, of collaboratories that we set up and monitored and 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 uh, nearly scientifically assessed in terms of their effectiveness and which then led to the to me writing the book did you come across any cultural differences within europe or outside europe is there a cultural difference in co-creation what i what i find uh, with the collaboratories is is that uh, 
that it works extremely well across all the cultures that I have ever seen it used. Um, I couldn't tell you, I don't have scientific proof as to why that is. I think that has much to do with um, the openness that, that it generates. Where it becomes challenging is where you have multiple cultures in one setting. Um, mm -hmm. And there, mm -hmm. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a question of making sure that uh, all of the voices are heard. So if, if, you have, if you have cultures, and I don't want to generalize, but uh, I have found in my experience that Asian cultures are much more, um, are holding themselves much more back in, 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 uh, in, bringing, in bringing ideas forward. So they, they may need a special invitation or they may need to be called to kind of contribute. And then as a facilitator, you just need to make sure you you don't forget an, on a whole group that is passively sitting there simply because in their culture, they don't find a way to access such a, a free and open way of, uh, of sharing ideas. Could you think of cases where open and collaborative innovation is not appropriate, where there are other reasons or there are good reasons not to open up an innovation process? Yeah, absolutely. If the if the issue is not complex or wicked, don't go for it, right? If you can, if two experts can solve it, my God, let the two experts solve it. Um, I think it's, I mean, open and participatory processes are lengthy, complex, messy processes that are not straightforward. So any 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 problem that you can solve uh, with less people and in a less in a less uh, complex and expensive and uh, uh, yeah, way, uh, do it, I would say. I would really reserve this only for those kind of problems that you <laughs> cannot solve any other way. And often sustainability issues are a part of that because they are multi-layered, wicked, uh, uh, complex. Uh, and that, that, to me, that makes them interesting, but that makes them expensive, lengthy, messy, uh, yeah, complicated. So uh, anything uh, that's a traditional, you know, anything that where the problem, the causality between problem and solution is clear, my God, don't go into an open process. Thank you very much. <laughs> pleasure, pleasure. <laughs>